Isaiah 53, verses 1 through 12, and the word of the Lord today reads from the King James text. Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter. And as the sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death. And he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. Hallelujah, Isaiah 53, 1 through 12. If you'll bow your heads with me one more moment, King Jesus, lover of men's souls, Savior of lost mankind, Master, we come before you today. Lord, I come before you with such humility of heart because I know the weight and the import of this message. I know how powerful and how important the word you've given me today can be. I ask God that the anointing of the Holy Ghost, the presence of the Almighty, would rest upon me in a very special way. I need God to be able to deliver this word without distraction. I need to be able to deliver this word today, God, without hindrance. I need, God, my body, my mind, my spirit to be quickened by the Holy Ghost so that I can faithfully execute the word of God in a manner that is pleasing in your sight. Lord, in a manner that will inspire, uplift, and courage, and bring revelation to the heart 
and the soul of every hearer. Master, touch our ears today and let every hearer have a mind and a heart to receive from the Holy Ghost that which you would desire to speak to us today by reason of your word. We ask all this and none other than Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Praise God and amen. There are any number of names or titles that we find described in the Word of God to the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't think it takes a Bible scholar to understand that Isaiah 53 is a prophetic word that speaks of the man Jesus Christ. Did you not see Jesus all through that passage? Everything it's talking about it is speaking hundreds and even thousands of years before the arrival of the Lord Jesus Christ. And yet it is telling us what He will look like and what He will experience and what He will do. It tells us of His humility. It tells us of his going to judgment and not speaking a word in defense of himself. It tells us of his willingness to die and to lay down his own life that he might bring salvation to the nation of Israel and even to the rest of the world that will believe. Throughout the Word of God, we read any number of names or titles that are used in reference to the Lord Jesus Christ. And I want to read just a few of them to you today. There are many. He is called Adam or the second Adam. He is called Advocate, Almighty, Alpha and Omega. He's called the Amen. He is called the Apostle of our profession. He is called the Arm of the Lord the author and the finisher of our faith. He is called the author of eternal salvation. He is called the beginning of creation of God. He's called beloved son, blessed and only potentate. He's called the branch, the bread of life, the captain of salvation, the chief shepherd, the Christ of God, the cons consolation of Israel. He's called the cornerstone. He's called creator. He's called day spring. Hallelujah. He's called deliverer. He's called desire of the nations. He's called the door. He's called the elect of God. He's called the everlasting father. He's called the faithful witness. The first and the last. The first begotten, the forerunner, glory of the Lord. He is called God. He is called God blessed. He is called good shepherd. He is called governor, great high priest, head of the church, heir of all things, holy child, holy one, holy one of God, holy one of Israel. He is called the horn of salvation. I am the image of God. Emmanuel, Jehovah, Jesus. Jesus of Nazareth, judge of Israel, the just one. King, king of the ages, king of the Jews, king of kings. Hallelujah. And he is called king of saints. He is called the lawgiver, the lamb, the lamb of God, leader and commander, the life. He is called light of the world, lion of the tribe of Judah, Lord of all, Lord of glory, Lord of lords, Lord of our righteousness, man of sorrows, mediator, messenger of the covenant, Messiah, mighty God, mighty one, morning star, Nazarene, only begotten son, 
our Passover, Prince of Life, Prince of Kings, Prince of Peace. He is called Johnny a Prophet. He is called the Redeemer. He is called the Resurrection and the Life. He is called the Rock, the Root of David, Rose of Sharon, Savior, Seed of Woman, Shepherd and Bishop of Souls, Shiloh, Son of the Blessed, Son of David, Son of God, Son of the Highest, Son, S-U-N, of Righteousness. He is called True Light, True Vine, Truth. He is called witness. He is called the word. And lastly, he is called the word of God. Hallelujah. That's an awful long list, isn't it? Amen. And every one of these names, every one of these titles, reference the man, the Lord Jesus Christ. And yet in that list of names and titles, there is one that I must tell you as one who was born and raised in the Pentecostal movement, I have not heard it preached a whole lot on. And uh, I've heard many sermons preached on Jesus being called Lord. I've heard many sermons preached on Jesus being called the Son of David and the Son of God. I've heard many a sermon preached particularly in oneness churches, apostolic churches, on Jesus being called the uh, Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. But there is one title in this list that I have not heard often preached, and I don't quite understand why I have not, because it is one of the most powerful and one of the most important titles that have, has ever been ascribed to the Lord Jesus Christ. And I have changed it a little bit from the list that I read to you a moment ago. They refer to it simply as the arm of God. What we read about today in our primary text, Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall. You see, the arm of the Lord in this passage, the arm of God, is spoken of as him. It is personalized. It is more than just a figurative appendage. But instead, the prophet says, there will be a man who literally is going to be, listen to me now, children, the arm of God. Oh, hallelujah. <laughs> There's going to be a man who literally is going to be the very arm of God extended toward humanity. Hallelujah. He is going to be the very hand of the Almighty to accomplish what the Almighty has declared in prophecy for centuries that he would accomplish by his own hand. Oh, hallelujah. In Psalm 98 and verse 1, the word of God reads, Oh, sing unto the Lord a new song. For he hath done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm hath gotten him the victory. In Isaiah 51 and verse 5, the word of God declares, My righteousness is near. My salvation is gone forth. And mine arms shall judge the people, the isles shall wait upon me, and on mine arm shall they trust. 
who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall. The arm of the Lord is not an appendage. The arm of the Lord is someone. Hallelujah. For he shall. The arm of the Lord is a he. Just like in John chapter 1, when John writes, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And he begins to speak of the Word as a person. You hear what I'm telling you now? So we know that the Word is not merely a utterance, a voiced and expressed thought or idea, but that there is a person who is the embodiment of God's very word. Do you hear what I'm telling you? There is a person, that same person, who is the embodiment of God's word, is the embodiment of God's right arm. Oh, hallelujah. When God wanted to save he didn't send somebody else to save. He did it by his own right arm. Hallelujah! He did it himself! He did it as a part of himself! He sent forth his own right arm to accomplish salvation. Hallelujah! My God, have mercy. And on my arm shall they trust when you understand that on his arm... Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he. You say, I only go that far because trying to get that thought through your mind help you understand that the arm is a he. Hallelujah. He said, and on his arm they shall trust. Who are they going to trust on? They're going to trust on Jesus. Why? Because Jesus is the visible right arm of God. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Not everybody sees it. Not everybody understands this truth today. That's why the writer in Isaiah prophetically writes, who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? See, Johnny, Bill, this afternoon we've been blessed because God's revealed His right arm to us. Hallelujah. He's helped us to see and to know and to understand who this one was that Isaiah prophesied about in Isaiah 53, verses 1 through 12. In Isaiah 59, 15 through 16, the prophet writes, Yea, truth faileth, and he that departeth from evil maketh himself a prey. And the Lord saw it, and it displeased him that there was no judgment or justice. And he saw that there was no man and wondered that there was no intercessor. Therefore, listen, his arm brought salvation unto him. Hallelujah! And his righteousness, it sustained him. Glory to God! Woo! God said, I saw that there was no man. <laughs> Are you following this plane as a nose on your face? He said, Are you seeing this today? There was no man who would stand up for justice, who would do right. So what did God do? He did it by his arm. Hallelujah. But we know from Isaiah 53 that his arm is not some spiritual principle or some spiritual adage or appendage. But it is instead the man, Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. An extension and a part of God himself. Glory to God. We use the term right-hand man. 
when we talk about someone who works closely with another and whom the head of a company or the head of an organization is able to rely upon completely and totally and that man does virtually everything and anything that needs to be done, right? right. You'll say, well, you know, so-and-so owns the company, but this guy here is his right-hand man. And that means that basically the right-hand man does everything needs to be done and gets everything done. But you see, Jesus was not God's right-hand man. Jesus was God's right hand. Hallelujah. Glory to God. He wasn't somebody who worked for God. He was the hand of God working for himself. Glory to God. God got the job done. And he did it himself in Isaiah 52 verses 6 through 10. I'm going to try to move quickly today. I have a lot of scripture. I like people to know when this preacher preaches, I'm not just throwing my opinions at you, but it's the word of the Lord. Amen. I'm getting hot up here. <laughs> Isaiah 52, verses 6 through 10. Therefore my people shall know my name. Therefore they shall know in that day that I am He that doth speak. Behold, it is I. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of Him that bringeth good tidings, that publishes, publisheth peace, that bringeth good tidings of good, that publisheth salvation, that saith unto Zion, Thy God reigneth. Thy watchmen shall lift up the voice, with the voice together shall they sing, for they shall see eye to eye, when the Lord shall bring again Zion. Break forth into joy, Sing together, ye waste places of Jerusalem. For the Lord hath comforted his people. He hath redeemed Israel, uh, Jerusalem. The Lord hath made bare his holy arm in the eyes of all the nations. And all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. Hallelujah. Therefore my people shall know my name. The word of God declares that there is no other name given among men under heaven whereby we must be saved. In Acts chapter 4 and verse 12. The word of God declares there is no name greater than the name Jesus. And the name Jesus means Jehovah is become salvation. Because Jesus was the right arm of God bringing salvation to the world. Jehovah didn't send somebody to do it. He did it by his own right arm. And unto whom? Is the arm of the Lord revealed? Hallelujah. I'm so glad today I know who the right arm of the Lord is. Hallelujah. Glory to God in Isaiah. Chapter 40, verses 1 through 10. Comfort ye, comfort ye my people, saith your God. Speak ye comfortably to Jerusalem and cry unto her that her warfare is accomplished and her iniquity is pardoned. For she hath received of the Lord's hand double for all her sins. The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Who is this prophecy speaking of? John the Baptist. 
every valley shall be exalted and every mountain and hill shall be made low and the crooked shall be made straight and the rough places plain and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. What is what comes out of the mouth of the Lord? The word of God. What is Jesus? The Word of God. But listen, he's not done yet. The voice said, cry. And he said, what shall I cry? All flesh is grass, and all the goodliness thereof is as the flower of the field. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, because the Spirit of the Lord bloweth upon it. Surely the people is grass. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Who is the word of our God? Jesus. But listen, he's not done yet. O Zion that bringest good tidings, get thee up into the high mountain. O Jerusalem that bringest good tidings, lift up thy voice with strength. Lift it up. Be not afraid, O Jerusalem, that bringest good tidings. Lift thy voice with strength, lift it up. Be not afraid, say unto the cities of Judah, Behold your God. Behold the Lord God will come with strong hand, and his arm shall rule for him. Hallelujah. Behold, his reward is with him and his work before him. Oh, he's prophesying about the ministry of John the Baptist. And he's saying part of John the Baptist's ministry is to declare, behold your God. <laughs> your God is coming. Here comes, look, here comes the visible right arm of God. Oh, hallelujah. Glory to the name of the Lord. John chapter 8, verses 23 through 30. I want to remind you what we read a moment ago in Isaiah 52, 6 through 10. Therefore my people shall know my name. Therefore they shall know in that day that I am he that doth speak. Behold, it is I. Remember that. John 8, 23 through 30, And he said unto them, Ye are from beneath, Jesus is speaking. Ye are from beneath, I am from above. Ye are of this world, I am not of this world. I said therefore unto you that ye shall die in your sins, if ye believe not that I am he. Ye shall die in your sins. Said in that day you shall know what? That I am He. Jesus said if you don't believe that I am He. He's using the identical language from the prophecy in the Old Testament. Are you following? Yeah. Let me tell you something. There wasn't a word wasted come out of Jesus' mouth. There was not one accidental syllable that ever come out of Jesus' mouth. Then said they unto him, Who art thou? And Jesus saith unto them, Even the same that I said unto you from the beginning. I have many things to say and to judge of you. But he that sent me is true, and I speak to the world those things which I have heard of him. They understood not that he spake to them of the Father. Then said Jesus unto them, when ye have lifted up the Son of Man, when you've crucified Him and put Him up on the cross, listen, then shall ye know that I am He. Hallelujah! And that I do nothing of myself. But as my Father hath taught me, I speak these things. And he that sent me is with me. 
The word of God declares that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. He that sent me is with me. The Father hath not left me alone, for I do always those things that please him. As he spake these words, many believed on him to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed. <laughs> Hallelujah. As he spake these words, all of a sudden people began to say, I believe I see the arm of the Lord. Hallelujah. I believe Jesus is the visible right arm of God. In John chapter 18, verses 3 through 6, Judas then, having received a band of men, and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees cometh thither with lanterns and torches and weapons. Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that should come upon him, went forth and said unto them, Whom seek ye? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus saith unto them, I am he. That's a pretty simple phrase. You said, I'm looking for somebody, and I answer you by saying, I'm the guy, I'm he, I am he. And Judas also, which betrayed him, stood with them. But now listen, look at the reaction he got from saying the words, I am he. As soon then as he had said unto them, I am he, they went backward and fell to the ground. <laughs> Hallelujah. There was divine revelation in those words. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. There was divine revelation. They couldn't even stand in the presence of Jesus when he made the simple declaration, I am he. Hallelujah. In that day, the Old Testament prophet said, you shall know that I am he. When the Lord declared, I am he, they all fell backwards to the ground. Can you imagine what an embarrassment that would be? <laughs> For a bunch of Roman soldiers who had come to arrest a man, and they can't even stand on their feet when he answers their question. My God have mercy. Isaiah 41 verse 10. Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee. Yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Oh, hallelujah. Jesus is called the righteousness of God. Hallelujah. In Mark 16, verse 19, so that after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. Here's a passage that many people who want to argue with oneness theology and one God doctrine, here's a passage they want to point to and say, see, the Bible said that Jesus sat on the right hand of God. Well, it's only a couple little problems with that. Number one, the Bible says that God is a spirit. So God doesn't have a form. He doesn't have a body. So how are you going to sit on the right hand of anybody that don't have a form and doesn't have a body? I'd like you to explain to me. Secondly, the Word of God said, The earth is my throne. Excuse me, the heavens are my throne. The earth is my footstool. When David wanted to build a temple for the Lord, God said, how are you going to build a temple for me? You couldn't build anything near big enough to accommodate me. The throne of, uh, excuse me, my footstool is the earth. The heaven is my throne. The earth is my footstool. How, where's Jesus going to sit if he's going to sit on the right hand of God? Way over here somewhere? Because obviously God occupies a lot of time and a lot of space. But you see, the Word of God tells us line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. you got to put all the pieces together. You don't just take one passage out of context. Well, let's read further. 
In Acts chapter 2 verse 33, therefore being by the right hand of God exalted and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he hath shed forth this which ye now see and hear. In Acts chapter 5 verse 31, him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior. For to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. Acts 7.55, but he being full of the Holy Ghost, talking about Stephen, the first, uh, the first one to be stoned in the church of record for his profession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. But he being full of the Holy Ghost looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. In verse uh, in chapter 7, verse 56, the next verse, Stephen said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Romans 8, 34, who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Colossians 3 and 1, if ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Hebrews 10 and verse 12, but this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. Hebrews 12 and 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. God. 1 Peter 3.22 Who is gone into heaven and is on the right hand of God? Angels and authorities and powers being made subject unto him. Say, so, okay, pastor, you just read a bunch of verses that convinced me Trinitarian theologians are correct. Oh, no. No, I have a question for you today. To whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? To who, who has believed our report and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? If Jesus is the visible right arm of God, then it would only make sense that the man Jesus Christ would appear where? At the right hand of God. Hello now. You see, you don't see all of God. God told Moses, no man can look upon me and live. He said, you can't look at me and live. So Stephen couldn't be looking at God and seeing God as God and see Jesus beside God because the Lord said, no man can look upon me and live. That's why when he showed himself to Moses, he had to put Moses in the cleft of a rock and he had to put his hand over Moses so Moses couldn't peek. And then he walked through the valley in some sort of a physical form so that Moses could see him. And then when he had passed through, he took away his hand so that Moses could see his backside. Because God told Moses, you can't look at me and live. It's not possible. The Word of God said, no man hath seen God in any time. But what these people are seeing and what they're testifying to is that the right arm of God is visible. Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the right arm of the Lord revealed? He. The right arm of the Lord is a he. 
the reason why every reference refers to the man Jesus Christ, the physical form of the man Jesus Christ, being at the right hand of God, the right hand of the Father, the right hand of the throne of God, is because the only thing visible to humanity is the right hand of God. Hallelujah. The arm that brought salvation to humanity. Do you understand what I'm telling you today? Hallelujah. My Lord, have mercy. It's really not all that difficult. John chapter 12, verses 37 through 41. I'm almost done today. But though he had done so many miracles before them, yet they believed not on him. That the saying of Esaias the prophet, Esaias is the Greek spelling for the name Isaiah, the one we read earlier. The prophet might be fulfilled, which he spake, Lord, who hath believed our report? And to whom hath the arm of the Lord been revealed? Right here, Jesus, excuse me, John is saying plainly, they didn't believe on Jesus, but you know what? That, that just harkens back to what Isaiah said. Lord, who hath believed our report? And to whom is the right arm of the Lord revealed? Jesus is the right arm of the Lord. Jesus is the right arm of God. But more than that, Jesus is the visible right arm of God. See, it's important to understand that distinction. He is the visible right arm of God. You can't see God, but you can see the right arm of God. Because God has manifested His right arm in the personage of the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, hallelujah. So when you look toward the throne of God, you will always see that visage of Jesus standing at the right hand. Why? Because He is the right arm of God. What significance is there in his being the right arm? The right arm is the place of power. The right arm is the place of authority. What did Jesus say? All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Isn't that what he said? Why? He's the right arm. The right arm is the place of power. Hallelujah. All power is given. Everything God's got, He's put into His right arm. Do you understand what I'm telling you today? He said, All authority is given unto me. He told old Pilate, He said, I have the power to lay down my life, and I have the power to take it up again. My God, have mercy. He said, there's no authority lacking in me, baby. Because all authority is in the right arm. When a king bears his scepter, go to England and look at the beautiful golden scepter that Queen Elizabeth carries that's ever present in the House of Lords, you know. Go there and look at that beautiful scepter. And when Queen Elizabeth comes and she makes a speech before the House of Commons and the House of Lords together, and she holds that scepter. Honey, where does she hold that scepter? In her right hand, in her right arm. Why? Because that is the place of authority. That is the place of power. <sighs> Lastly, it is a place of honor. When you put someone at your right hand side, that's a place of honor. You remember the disciples were arguing amongst themselves who would sit at Jesus' right side? Why were they arguing about who would sit at his right side? Nobody cared about who'd sit at his left side. No, because at the right side is the place of honor. God has revealed his right arm in the manifestation of the man Jesus Christ in order to bring salvation
And that right arm is still visible. You can still see that right arm today. It is. It would appear to be seated beside God. It would appear to be on the right side of God. It is on the right side of God in as much as it is the right arm of God. Revealed physically, literally, visibly revealed. Hallelujah. But though he had done so many miracles before them, yet they believed not on him that the saying of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled which he spake. Lord, who hath believed our report? And to whom hath the arm of the Lord been revealed? Therefore they could not believe because that Esaias, or Isaiah, said again, He hath blinded their eyes and hardened their heart, that they should not see with their eyes, nor understand with their heart, and be converted, and I should heal them. These things said Esaias, when he saw his glory, and spake of him. Spake of who? Spake of Jesus. Jesus is the glory of God. The Word of God said we see the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. God has declared in the Old Testament more than one time, and my glory will I not give unto another. So if you see the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ, there can only be one reason. <laughs> because God don't share His glory with anybody. Hallelujah. Said, Isaiah wrote this. Isaiah wrote these words when he saw Him. Prophetically, God revealed the arm of the Lord to him. He revealed Jesus to him. He was a man of sorrow, acquainted with grief. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. It's talking about Jesus. It's talking about his passion. It's talking about his crucifixion. It's talking about his sacrifice. Am I telling the truth today? My question for you today is, has the arm of the Lord been revealed to you? Have you seen the visible right arm of God? I thank God every day I come into this one God Jesus name way. Because when I did, I suddenly realized... That Jesus wasn't God's right hand man. Jesus is God's right arm. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Would you stand with me this afternoon? Praise the name of the Lord.